you everybody for joining our podcast. This is uh, episode one of the Dynasty Podcast. And uh, I just want to introduce to uh, all of our listeners, all of our fans listening in, um, what we want to do with this podcast, how we're going to go about doing this podcast. And um, ultimately what we want to do is we want to be able to share our authentic experiences with our fans, uh, anybody that's listening in, um, share basically the, the Asian experience, our perspective, our POV on uh, any subject that we are going to touch on uh, throughout the episodes, as, as you'll see in our podcast. And uh, we're going to try and give you, you know, an unfiltered perspective on things. And hopefully our audience will remember to keep an open mind and, um, and, and give us a chance to uh, basically just express ourselves. So I think, I think uh, doing this Dynasty podcast is a pretty unique um, opportunity to be able to share with the world, um, probably in a different platform where we're not able to do that. But with the power of the internet and the power of podcasting now, we're kind of able to get our voices out there a little bit more and uh, talk about everything that, that has everything to do with Dynasty and, and also the, the, the Asian experience. So for our first episode, we have uh, our guest and friend, uh, Mr. Kenji Miyamoto-san. Um, so yeah, take, take a moment. Up, you guys? Yeah, so why don't you just take take a couple minutes to uh, introduce yourself to our to our listeners. Cool. All right. Well, yeah, it's my, it's my pleasure to be on the podcast first time. So uh, my name is Kenji Miyamoto, uh, fourth generation Japanese American. Um, I met Danny's connected through the brand, through Dynasty MMA. But kind of like what we're alluding to is that, yeah, on the service level, it's a brand about martial arts or about MMA. But with the mentality of a martial artist, we can kind of see that that mentality is connected to more than just the aspect of fighting but to the approach to our lifestyle, to our philosophy, to identity. There's a lot of different links that having the mind of a martial artist has that I think this podcast kind of gives us the opportunity to talk about. It's not just simply moves or style, but it's actually kind of the way that you carry yourself or the way that you interact in the world. And then also being particularly Asian American, how it relates to our culture and our roots, I think is a big part of our identity that um, maybe this podcast could kind of help show beyond just fashion and style sure and uh yeah just tell tell the viewers a little bit about yourself like what do you do like uh what's your profession all right well um i am currently a phd student i'm finishing up my doctorate i'm studying clinical psychology Um, right now i'm finishing up my dissertation and what i'm doing is research on the media and asian american stereotypes specifically the impact on asian american male stereotypes um I'm finishing up my dissertation, and pretty soon I'll be uh, actually next month I'll be presenting in New York uh, regarding my dissertation topic. Um, I'm also uh, going to get published for the first time. Um, I'm writing an article about the effect of the Japanese American internment camps. That's some heavy stuff, heavy stuff, my friend. Um, which is perfect because you know for for our first episode to kind of kick things off, you know, having you invited you in. Why don't you just why don't you tell us a little bit about um, your experiences growing up uh, in America as a you know fourth generation Japanese American? Like start right from the top, my friend. Sure, sure. Well, I mean, just to go back to my family history, um, my grandparents were both students at UCLA when um, the internment camps broke out. So actually, they were just, just like young college students but they got married in order to be sent to the same relocation camp. Mm-hmm. So it's like, if it wasn't for the fact that they got married, they would have been sent completely apart. So they so got they married to get married together. before they, they, they yeah. were sent to the camps. Exactly. So, so what, what happened, sent- what happened exactly there? Like, how did they know they were going to be sent there? Was it like a letter that came into their mailbox yeah, the, the executive order, um, it, it, word got out, and then once it started, got posted, and once um, the order was out for all Japanese Americans to be um, to have to turn themselves in, they rushed to the courthouse and had it signed. Holy crap, because, I mean, what was going on through their mind at the time, do you think? Were they like, 
I, I would assume like they were frightened, they were afraid, or were they not? Were they kind of like, okay, we have each other, that type of thing? Like, what were what was going on through their minds? You think? Well, it's interesting because I mean, talking to my grandparents or talking to my grandma, um, who now she's ninety six, but whenever I tried to talk to them about it, they always minimized and they always made it like it was no big deal. They're like, oh, it's just something we had to deal with. Or, like, it's just something we had to, like, suck up at the time. And it's like, well, we couldn't really fight back or we couldn't really um, do anything about it. So we just had to do the best we can. And they were, like, but 20 then, years old. 20, 21? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah that's yeah, crazy. Yeah, yeah, like 1920. Yeah, yeah. 19 or that's crazy mm-hmm. because you think of the, you know, your average 19-year-old, 20-year-old nowadays, you know, the, <laughs> that would like shock them to the core if, if they were to, to go through the same thing. But I have a feeling like the 20 year old, 21 year old of like 80 years ago would be like so much more mature. Cause I mean, you don't have internet, you don't have anything like that. So True. you have to actually talk to people in real life and you grow up a, way more faster because you're pushed into these situations where you actually have to be an, excuse me, you have to actually be an adult about things. True. Well, yeah, I mean, if you just think about the lifestyle and about, you know, growing up as an Asian American at that time, how hard you would have to work or the opposition you would have to have as opposed to now where, you know, you just work your job and you go on Facebook or whatever. I mean, the the issues or the hard work that you had to put in for a, a daily lifestyle at that time probably was a little bit more intense at the time, too. And and they were college students. And what kind of jobs did they have at the time? Did they have any like part-time jobs or anything like that before that whole whole thing got interrupted? Uh, I know they were working. I know they were working because um, they were born and raised in L.A. But I know something that was pretty cool is that one of my grandma's um, teachers at UCLA was sympathetic um, to what she was going through and what the Japanese Americans were going through. Right. So my grandma actually wrote letters mm-hmm. back and forth to the UCLA professor telling him what the camps were like. And he actually did research and wrote a book about the camps and like some of the information my grandma gave him um, informed what he knew about the camps. And then for her diploma, she was, um, she was already interned by the time the graduation ceremony happened. So the professor actually went to the camp and was able to like sneak her diploma in. So she was able to get it. Wow. So run us through. So they, they got the notice they they went and got married right away, and then then what happened? Like police showed up to their door and like cuffed them and and put them into a uh, car. It's mandatory that you had to go to a checking station, something like that. And then I, they ended up, I think, at one of the major race tracks, you know, like horse racing tracks. Oh, okay. And that was like the center where you check yourself in or you get sent. And then when you just like camp out in the race tracks they um, divide which of the camps they're going to send you to, like Manzanar or whatever. Um, my grandparents got sent to Colorado, to Amache, Colorado. Okay. And that's, uh, that's where my dad was conceived and born, was in Colorado. And they did, I guess, how long did they stay in there? And, and was your dad born, like, did they do the act of procreation before they got to the internment camps or was it during the time they were in the internment camps? Like, how did that happen? You know, I, it, I'm a little fuzzy about the details, but when you ask about that, I'm definitely, definitely fuzzy. And actually I don't even want to know. But <laughs> cause the, I don't know, man, cause they would have had to, you know, pull some ninja shit off within the in- internment camps to, to actually make that happen. Would that not be true? Like, I'm, I'm sure it happened all the time. I, I mean, see. So, like, like how of, long were they in there for? I, I'm not 100% sure, but I think about two year, two and a half years. And what were they doing while dad, they were in there? Uh, it was just a lot of, you know, barbed wire, just empty, like, flat land. Um, so they were basically in jail. Like, they couldn't do anything. They didn't. No, it was like it was like a bunker community kind of thing. Right, and they like, would they would like would they get to like I don't know like exercise? Would they get to read books? What was it like that yeah, like the day to day there? I don't think there were limitations per se on like the daily structure. So it's not like they had to work or it's not like they had to do labor or anything. But they were just 
completely limited to the enclosure. In so, their I mean, own, they had, in their own little enclosure. And were they allowed any outside communication, anything like that? Oh uh, no, it's severely limited. I'm sure they had like specific like like mail and stuff like that was able to go in and out, but it's not like they were had free passes to to go or to come in, you know. Right. So obviously, the, obviously television was not invented then. Um, <laughs> I don't think the radio was invented then. Um, uh, I don't think that was the telephone invented by then. I think radio was around at that radio time. Radio was around. Telephone was around. Maybe black and white TV. I'm not sure, but yeah. No, like, no, radio. no. TV came in like 19 what 40s, 50s, 60s, something like that. It wasn't that yeah. early. Yeah, yeah, I could yeah, be yeah, wrong. Yeah. I mean, if I if I had a if I had somebody behind me somewhere here working with me, they would fact check that for me. But I don't have anybody else for me right here. Um, oh, no, 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 no. I think TV was invented. I, I'm not 100% sure. I'm going back. I'm going back to like <laughs> my old Asian studies, like freshman year stuff. And they had like a lot of like anti-Japanese propaganda at the time. Right. Because they, they, had, they had Bugs Bunny killing Japanese people. So I'm like, if they had Bugs Bunny killing Japanese people, then I think they had TV. Right. And and I actually remember that Dr. Seuss story. If you if you remember the origins of uh, Dr. Seuss, he was um, I think he was like a famous illustrator or a comic book writer or something like that. And at the time, because, you know, anti-Japanese sentiment was so high, he actually drew a lot of, you know, racist kind of anti-Japanese comics uh -huh, um, uh -huh. and, you know, showing Japanese people as like these. Uh, yellow peril, so to speak, like, yeah, like mindless, uh, you know, robots, and they're they're out to get you, yeah. and like fear, and all that type of stuff. And and he actually drew those kinds of comics. And at the time, it it was okay. And um, and it wasn't only until like afterwards, like after the war was over and stuff like that, did Doctor Seuss actually became like you know mainstream, known for like his uh, uh you know his children's comics, his children's gotcha. books. Um, so yeah, actually just fact checking it right now. So t TVs were invented, uh, San Francisco, 1927. The earliest is 1927. Um, uh -huh. so there you go. So, <laughs> so I guess that's, yeah, you, you would have TVs around then. Um, but yeah. how, what, what else was, was it like in there? Is there any other kind of stories that you know, your grandparents have told you or that your dad told you? Um, uh, anything, it's pretty interesting. Side? I think I think the older that I'm getting and the older that they're getting, the more that they're able to kind of process it. Because like growing up young, and then when I first first like got educated and even learned what the camps were and learned that my family came from them, like whenever I go, tell me what it was like or what was it like, and they, and they would literally just kind of like brush it off. They'd be like, oh yeah, it, it's what we had to do or yeah that's we just had to deal with it but um my grandma who's 96 now like she's getting a little bit of dementia and all that but yeah. i remember her getting actually a little bit emotional about it um like do, do you have a feeling it. like it was hard. do you have a feeling like it was actually a lot harder for them than what it is and it's probably an unhappy part of their time and they don't want to actually bring it back up because exactly that probably exactly. a hard time so, mm -hmm. I, I and guess also too, I mean, just uh, the fear of the unknown, because like we could look at history and look back and go, okay, they got stuck in the camps and you know they were able to endure it, and then it kind of wore down after the war was over. But I'm sure when you're caught up in that moment mm -hmm. and you're you have no idea what's going to happen, are, am I going to get deported? Are we going to be get sent apart? Are we going to go to jail? Like, I'm going to be executed? Who knows? I mean, just. The fact that we could look back and know how it ended up, but I'm sure when you just get taken from your home or you're not able to work or you have to drop out of school, just like the the, the fear of not having any idea where this is going to go, I'm sure was a million times worse than us looking back and trying to understand it too. Right. And did they own any property at the time? Like were their homes taken away from them? How did they get yeah, it back? Uh, uh, a lot of people didn't. Um, they had to either um, – get shortchanged and sell or they just had to abandon or if they had um non-japanese family that was able to take care of it i think my uh they had an apartment complex that they okay. had to leave or something like that okay wow and 
so your dad was born in the actual internment camps. And, yeah, yeah, in Colorado. Uh, and I don't know if he'd be able to remember any of that. Has your dad told you anything? No, no, he 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 was only there for like the first one two years of his life. So right. Just but did your but house. did your grandparents tell your dad about anything? And then did did your dad then pass it on to you? Is there anything there? Mm, not there's books in a way it's kind of like the more we talk about it it's we talk about it through like a third transition like he won't say this is what i remember or this is what i experienced but like say we'll see like a movie or say we'll see a book and you go oh yeah it was like that what so movie? it's like he would really say what like movie? uh like for example um it was pretty cool we just saw the broadway play the one by George Takei. Yeah, that's um, exactly what it is. Because I'm like, he made a whole play out of that. And I wanted to watch it while I was uh, visiting New York. But, uh, you know, I didn't end up doing it. So tell me about that. How was that? It was really cool. Because I think, you know, growing up as like a young, angry, proud Asian American male. Um, whenever I hear stories about the internment camps, right? The first thing I think, and it's just like black and white simple. It's like. Why don't you fight back? Why don't you resist? Why don't you uh, rebel? Why don't you fight back? And then they had like um, a questionnaire right. in the camps that was dividing people. And it was called like the no, no and the yes, yes boys. I'm not sure if you heard that before. No, no, uh, never. Tell us about that. Yeah, there was a questionnaire and it was like a big, like bland questionnaire. Like you do this, you do that. Yes, no, whatever. But there were, the only point of the questionnaire existing was that there were two questions. And one was... Are you willing to um, renounce any ties you have to Japan? Or it's like something like that related about like, are you willing to um, be fully American and renounce being Japanese? Mm -hmm. And so what they, they did was to kind of weed out who they thought was loyal and who they thought would be a, a threat in the camps. And then if you stayed loyal to Japan and you weren't able to like renounce your Japanese identity, people got deported or sent to jail or whatever. And that's what they used that form for. Um, so I remember when I read it, so when I, I remember like being young and when I read about it, I'd be like, hell no, it was like, I'm in jail. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say, yay, America, I'm not Asian because you just locked me and my family up. So, I mean, growing up, I always wanted to fight, always wanted to rebel. And I always right. said, that wouldn't be me. I wouldn't do that. That right. wouldn't be me. But I think watching the Allegiance or Alliance, I'm not sure, the George Takei one. Right. Um, and it shows. I think, I think it was Allegiance, yeah. Yeah, allegiance. Yeah. Showing the struggle of like young people in love or young people with families or young people worried about um, their parents being sick or dying alone or whatever, um, and then having to take the safe road or, or be a lot um, to pledge allegiance to America. I, being, I think, being older myself, like now that I'm in my 30s and now I'm in a relationship and all that, I could I could see it being a bigger difficult um, challenge to. Am I going to let my pride to fight for my identity, which, hell yeah, I want to, but then also saying, am I also willing to lose being locked up and never seeing my family again, never seeing my right. parents again? Because you know, they, so, would, they would probably, they probably would have like deported your ass or, or, yeah, or locked, exactly. you in jail, locked you in jail forever. So it's kind of a tough spot. It's like, all right, you know, you either say yes. And we'll lock you up, or you say no, and you know you could you you get to be in America still, um, you know uh -huh. tough tough call, right? So, yeah. and yeah, you know, so I kind of as an adult seeing that, I was able to see a different um, perspective and how complicated it, as it was. But when I was like a young man, I used to be like, no, just fight, just fight, you know. But yeah. it's, it's a lot more complicated. Than yeah, that. and especially you know if I mean. Obviously, if you were Japanese American at the time, you're going to be outnumbered, right? It's not like mm -hmm. there's a huge Japanese population where it's like you're, you're, you're you know, you, it's not like you're 50% of the, the the country or whatever. It's not like you could just riot yeah. and and fight back. No, you're you're completely outnumbered. You're 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 racial minority. Um, mm -hmm. So you know they lock you up in internment camps. It's almost like you don't have it. There's nothing you can do. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do you see that playing out? Today, like uh, today, <laughs> not to get all like political and everything. I don't, yeah, I don't, exactly. I don't wish to go into like politics and stuff like that. I'm not really that big of a politics guy. Um, you know, talking about that stuff doesn't really like interest me a whole lot. 
Um, mm-hmm. I'd rather I'd rather avoid the topic if I could, but at the same time, it seems like we're almost heading towards like World War Three territory, or like you know yeah. that, that, that okay. China is the enemy now, you know, because mm-hmm. China is the economic superpower, and it's almost like well, there's a significant Chinese population in America. Um, mm-hmm probably the largest asian you know uh, asian population group you know in 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 america and you know it seems like chinese internment camps are like seems like it might be a reality now you know with the with with, yeah, you know, yeah. with your with your president and everything so what are your viewpoints on that oh i know i forgot he's mine i forgot you're up in Canada. yeah i'm not american <laughs> yeah. that's the thing I'm, I'm canadian right so i'm i'm relatively safe but you know, you guys have your new president. So, how do you feel about that? Like, do you think Chinese internment camps is is is, is like on the table? Well, like, I I don't want to get too political, but I think it is definitely definitely relevant. Um, for example, having a lot of friends and people close that are here legally, on say a student visa, or say are here for you know here not as citizens but here visiting the country, right. automatically like one who's here on a student visa is already right. afraid like if i do one thing wrong am i going to get deported or if i right. fly a domestic flight, am i going to get deported i'm going to get kicked out of the country even though i'm here legally so right. just the fear of thinking who belongs and who doesn't belong or if you're different you're going to get deported i mean that fear is a reality and i right. think just the idea of like the muslim ban or or targeting any racial group as they are the enemy I mean, right. that's that's the line of thinking that causes things like the Japanese internment camps. Right. And, you know, America, you know what I mean? Like, I know most of the I know most of the listeners listening in here are probably going to be American. And it's uh-huh. not like, oh, this this episode or this podcast is, is about America bashing or something like that. No, I don't want people to get the wrong idea. You know, that's not what the Dynasty podcast is about. But, you know, we're just talking about it. Right. We're just sharing our experiences. And there there is a general, you know underlying fear that Mm -hmm. you know america gives to its own citizens uh honestly you you know and 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 especially when it relates to asians because Mm -hmm. asians are seen by the american public and the american media as quote unquote perpetual foreigners you know what i mean Mm -hmm. you're walking down the street or whatever it is you know we strike up a conversation with somebody and eventually it gets into the territory where it's like, oh, where are you, where are you, where are you from? Where are you from? Like, where are you, where are you come from? And they don't mean physically where you come from. It's like, which part of Asia are you from? Like, are you, like, automatically assuming you're an immigrant, right? And and this is not stuff that, hey, I'm just kind of taking out of my ass and just throwing it out on, uh, in the air. But um, this this is actually real fact. So recently. Um, there was a study done, and I, I actually just saw this the other week, so it's actually kind of perfect mm-hmm. timing. Um, there was the Asian American male study um, mm. conducted by a, a, a group of. Um, you you, you got to look it up. It's a. Uh, it's actually right right up. It's it's right out there. Uh, a- Asian American male study. Okay. Um, I'm just pulling. I'm just pulling it up right now because they they got the results. And uh, it's kind of cool that we can take this chance and dive into it a little bit. Um, it's done by a guy at, from from it's a YC founder or something. I don't know. It, it's by some dude, right? So mm-hmm. he surveyed over 500 Asian American men, um, and and there it, it's on it's on the internet, so you can look this up right now. So Asian American male uh, man study. 2015 results, 2016 results. You you can look at it. I'm not about to go through it like slide by slide or anything, but it's interesting because for for the first time ever, I think in in history, there's something like this being done in a modern time where they can start seeing what it's like to be an Asian American male. And the reason why I'm saying it's an Asian American male because and we'll probably get into this in, in, in you know, oh, <laughs> just about a few minutes from now. Um, the experience as an Asian American male is totally different from an Asian, <laughs> Asian American woman or a female. Yes. Like, it's completely yeah. different. Now, now, before we open up that can of worms, back to my original point was this study that they did 
actually tells us a lot. So back to the whole thing about, okay, where are you from? The study showed that like something like 60 to 70 percent of Asian American men in this survey, in the survey group, mm -hmm. when they talk to somebody, when they when they have a conversation with someone, they get asked that 70 percent of the time. So mm -hmm. back to the original point, we are seen as perpetual foreigners. So so there's a definite fear in the air, which, like we were saying, it, it's a real fear that your girlfriend and people like her who are maybe not exactly American citizens, they're here studying, um, maybe even traveling here, that there's a real chance that they're going to be deported, even just traveling locally, you're saying, like even if they're going from state to state. Yeah, I mean, just having this idea that they have like immigration checkpoints or the idea that you have to show your papers or just the underlying theme that you have to prove you're American or prove that you're allowed to be here. I mean, it's become a, uh, not just a paranoia, but a reality that, you know, whether there's ICE checkpoints or whether you have to show papers or whatnot, it's just, and then tying it into the, where are you from? Just being, regardless of the fact of you have to sh prove that you're an American, just the fact that being Asian or looking like an Asian person automatically is going to make you assume that you're not from here is another just a judgment that we're going to have to deal with or we are currently dealing with. Right. And it's it's crazy to think about because, you know, if I were to share my experiences a little bit, like I'm up in Canada, I don't really that 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 never crosses my mind. Like I'm I that never happens where, you know, I'm walking around and I feel like, "Oh, I'm judged by how I look or I'm judged by the the color of my skin." or I'm judged by my uh, immigration status or, 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 yeah. or citizenship status or whatever. But it's, it's funny yeah. because anytime I take a trip to America, once I cross the border, I get a different feeling. Once I get off the, the airplane, it's always like, ooh, all of a sudden I've entered this zone where everything's about race <laughs> now. So uh -huh. <laughs> every, anytime I, I, I step off the airplane, it's like, ooh, all of a sudden people are judging me because I'm an Asian guy. And mm -hmm. I, 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 it's not even something – it's not even like – it's not even like, oh, it's something I'm looking for. It's, it's not something where it's like confirmation bias or anything like that. I do feel it that way. Maybe as a kid, you know, maybe when I was like 15 or 20 or whatever, wasn't mm -hmm. so aware of the world. Maybe I don't didn't really see it that way. But now it's almost like, oh, every time I step step off the plane – Obviously, this also depends, uh, you know, from state to state as well. So I've gotten more of that judgy kind of vibe when I'm on the East Coast. Yeah, when I'm on yeah. the West Coast, I actually don't get that kind of vibe. When I'm on the West Coast, it feels like Canada to me. Like if when mm -hmm. I get off and I'm in California, I don't get as much of that. People are seem cool. People seem chill. People don't really judge you as much based on like you know what you look like or, or or what race you are whatever but you know i've been to new york probably like five times now and i would say pretty much bang on every single time i've been to new york there's something weird that happens where somebody is judging me because i'm asian or something like that or or or, or i seem like i'm an easy target or something like that um and I can get into some examples. Oh, I might as well get into some examples now. So yeah, yeah. this with the examples. It's it's strangely enough, it didn't come from white people actually. So it it, it actually came from some black people. So uh, I, I guess it's just yeah. the population thing. I, I guess it's just more black people happen to be there in New York City at the right place at the right time, interacting with me. But I'm trying to recall. Okay, so that that one time I was in. Um, Oh, this is a good one. This is a good one. So one time I was in uh, Times Square. Um, Times Square. I was just walking with my buddies, right? And 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 this this one guy was selling like Comedy Central tickets or whatever it is, uh -huh. right? So he was selling he was selling tickets, and I was whatever. I was just minding my own business. I was just walking along, and he was all like, "Hey, hey, hey, buy him tickets, buy these tickets, blah blah." blah. And I'm like, "No, I'm good. I'm okay." And then. Mm -hmm. He, he kind of like followed up with a joke because almost as if 
he knew I wasn't going to like retaliate or, or anything because whatever, I'm an Asian guy. So, you know, maybe I'm like an easy target. Maybe I didn't even speak English. So uh -huh. he was, what did he say? He said, um, Oh, what, why you gotta like do, why you gotta be like that? Like, why you gotta be like that? Like, like, as if like, I didn't trust, trust him or something like that. It's like, why you gotta uh -huh. be like that? Like, we all know, like, Asians sell the most drugs or something like that. Some some crazy accusation out of nowhere. Freaking, uh, we know Asians sell the most drugs, but judging from your hairstyle, you're probably from North Korea or something. I was like, what? Well, like, Combine this one and that one and that. Threw, I was like, what? I was like, that's not even funny. I was like, is this guy trying to be funny? So uh, I got pretty pissed. I was like, I'm on vacation. I'm supposed to be having a good time. And all of a sudden, randomly, this dude – doesn't matter if he was black, white, Mexican, whatever. Doesn't matter. He was just straight up like dissing me. He was just straight up making fun of me. So then I got pissed. I'm not about to like reenact myself being pissed right now. That's not the point. But I was pissed and I just lashed back out at him like right away. Like after like two seconds, I was like, no, I can't let this slide. Uh -huh. You just said some bullshit thing to me, like some ridiculous left field thing to me. And you like assumed i was like whatever north korean or whatever it is uh, so i just lashed right back at him i just like whatever said a bunch of things mm -hmm. like whatever it doesn't matter it doesn't even matter what i said but i just lashed I back out at him and he was so whatever. surprised you know he was mm -hmm. so surprised because he probably thought i was like a tourist he probably thought like i couldn't couldn't speak english uh, uh -huh. he, he picked me out, you know, he thought I was an easy target, whatever Asian people like probably don't talk back, you know? So he was like, Oh, all right. I'm, I'm sorry, dude. And whatever. And he it was really like, wasn't smaller than me. Cop, like they won't say much thinking back. You know, once you like say, show that you're actually, you know, defiant, they're not going to have any retaliation for that. So yeah, absolutely. Oh, <laughs> sorry. We're about to introduce you real quick. Um, yeah. I'm just going to finish up real quick. So, so, uh, yeah, Liang, Liang joined the call. We're just going to introduce you real quick in a second. So let me just finish yeah. with the story. So, I mean, he was he was smaller than me, so he couldn't do anything to me. So it wasn't like I was afraid of, like, well, even if he was bigger than me, I didn't care. Like, I would still have talked back to him because I'm just like that, right? I'm just going to stand up for myself because there's no point in me not standing up for myself. But my friends had to jump in and pull me back. They're like, all right, it's cool, Danny. Like, it's not worth going to jail for, whatever it is. Because I wasn't backing down. I was, like, going to escalate it. I was like, <laughs> you know, yeah, you ready, I don't huh? care. Like, let's, let's, do, let's do it. Um, so they, they helped me back and whatever. And it's funny. They told me afterwards, after I got back in my friend's car, and he was he's from New York, like, local New York. He's, uh, he's from, like, where is he from? He's from, like, Long Island, like, near there, uh, my, my friend Christian. So after I got back into his car, he was like, then he told me, he was like, damn, Danny, like, you really showed us that you were a part of that New York style. Like you're from New York. Like you showed us that, that East coast attitude there. You were not playing. Like you're about to kill that guy or something. So I thought it was pretty interesting. I thought it was pretty funny, but you know, the second incident that I had, you know, again, it was from New York and I got, this one happened like right when I got off the airplane too. So I got off the airplane and you know, freaking JFK, airport it's ridiculous that you know the biggest busiest airport probably in america or probably in the whole world doesn't have free wi-fi and they purposely do it so you know, they make you pay for it right so i get off the the airplane i i'm searching for some wi-fi so i can contact my friends so i, I can meet up with them and again not to like stereotype this totally not trying to stereotype this at all guys so but it happened to be like three black people again right so again i'm not making this stuff up so I, I go to the uh the 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 one of the desks the british airway desks that had wi-fi there right it was so weird it happened so quickly i didn't even know what to make of it right it was such a strange strange ordeal so i, I went up to the desk i saw that they had wi-fi i was like hey excuse me um would i be able to know what the wi-fi password is like i'm asking it like you know super nice you know being being super friendly right you know canadian style yeah and the the woman, the black woman that was working there, she automatically got pissed. She was she said something to me. I couldn't really hear what she said. I was like, I'm sorry, like, like so I was like, I'm sorry, like could, could you repeat that? And I was genuinely like serious, like, I couldn't hear what she said. 
And then she started getting upset. And then the, the black dude working next to her automatically started escalating the situation. He was like, she already told you what the password was. Like literally like that kind of attitude. Like she already told you what the password was. Get the get out of here. That type of shit. Right. I was like, whoa. I was like, whoa, whoa. What the fuck? Right. Uh, I didn't even have a moment to respond. I didn't even have a moment to react. I was like, this, this is happening so fast. I was like, whoa, what the, what the fuck? And then a third black dude who also worked at the airport, he was like pulling up some luggages or something like that. He was on my right side. These guys were on my left side. He, he joined in. He ganged up on it. He's like, yeah, you're not even supposed to be here. Like, get out of this area. This is for British Airway, like, customers <laughs> only. I was like, whoa, 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 what the fuck? And then next thing I know, I'm like, I walked away, and I was so shocked. I didn't even know how to respond. I was like, I was just standing there. I was like, whoa. Uh, all right. Like, what the hell happened? What did I even do? I simply asked a question, right? Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden it was like getting ganged up on and then people were attacking me left, right and center. And like, so I'm like, whoa, I'm like, man, these must be like some frustrated, angry, you know, working long hours. They weren't having none of my shit type of deal. Uh-huh. And, you know, they also happen to be from New York, which adds to my list of poor experiences in New York. And they just happen to also be black. So adding to my poor experiences meeting random strangers who are black but but no i mean I, there's positive experiences as well like i mean obviously i, I met other friends of mine who are, who are also black in, in new york and they're totally friendly cool people so obviously not everybody's like that but it just so happened that on the east coast in america it seems like the defense uh, 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 threshold is like super high it's like you do anything wrong we're, like it, it, it's on you do anything wrong it's like the arguments start like and fists start flying it, it feels like the tension is pretty high up there and then like on the west coast it's not like that at all on the west coast it's like oh yeah cool sure you know where you're from blah 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 blah, blah. and it's you don't get that vibe at all people mm-hmm. tend to be friendlier people tend to be like not so much like with a stick up their ass and type of shit so anyway that's kind of how i experience it and um I don't know how we got to here, but it doesn't matter. Let's run it back. Um, okay, so we actually, actually, Liang joined the call. You know, just just introduce us. Yeah, so fourth year medical student uh, on the East Coast. Uh, East Coast all my life, never really left. So I know nothing more about America than the East Coast. So unfortunately, never really got to experience the chillness of the West Coast and for an extended amount of time. Uh, been to Toronto a few times. I uh, thought it was really cool. A lot of Asians rocking around. Not cool. really used to seeing that. Um, yeah. So, so which part of through, America? Which part of the East Coast? So from Philadelphia originally. Philadelphia. Um, so like kind of close to like New York, kind of a sim- similar New York vibe. You know, kind of like tense people. You know, mm-hmm. like kind of confrontational a little bit, but maybe to a lesser extent than New York. Right. Um, been here for uh, four years. Right now I'm like southeastern Virginia. Like very few Asians, except for like some Filipinos from the Navy. So Virginia. this area is a big military town, been here for medical school, I'm about to graduate med school. I'm heading up to Long Island, New York next year to do like my intern year, med, intern year residency, but then I'm heading back down, back to where I am right now for three more years of residency following that. So, you know, just going up and down the East Coast, that's how I'm, I've always been. Right. So, med school yeah. and you're starting to become, I guess, a doctor. Yeah, a uh, doctor specializing <laughs> in like... Uh, rehab, re- rehabilitation medicine is what I'm going to be doing. Right. So. Awesome. And, and, and it's kind of cool because our first episode here, we have, you know, clinical psych, did I get that right? Clinical psychology. Yeah, clinical psychology. Uh, uh-huh. What is it? Masters, PhD, something like that. Yeah. PhD. 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 Nice. And we have, yeah. you know, guys studying to be a doctor. So I'm the odd one out of the group here. I'm not like super <laughs> professional, educated, You're whatever. But, you know, I make up for that with a little bit of creativity and, uh, you know, artistic stuff, I guess. Sure, so, yeah, uh, sure. You got a brand, man. <laughs> yeah. Nah, nah, it's nothing, nothing major like that. But yeah, it's, it's cool that, you know, for episode one, we kind of got you guys in. And um, so, before we kind of go in with with uh, Liang here, I, I just want to 
uh, just finish up with Kenji. Well, not necessarily finish up, but I know Kenji had something to say, and 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 obviously, uh, Liang, you can you can drop in, you know, your own comments here and there. Um, so you're doing your. Tell us what you're writing in that Asian American paper. Tell us, just just run us through, like. Oh man, I mean, there's there's plenty there's plenty to to chop up, but we I got think, time. Uh, we got time. Well, I mean, well, one thing, one thing that I, I could bring up, I thought it's interesting um, when we were talking about discrimination or being treated like you're different, and how you were talking about a lot of incidents with um, African Americans, right? Uh, I think something that is both problematic and systematic, and something that would lead towards a solution or better race relations, is I think the way that Asian or at least Asian Americans um, are stereotyped is we kind of fit into this other category um, that is not necessarily the same thing as being a people of color, right? You say people of color, you think African Americans, you think Hispanic maybe, you think people of, you know, people of color as a minority group. But because Asians are not seen, definitely not seen as white, but then they're also not seen as people of color, they're kind of stuck at this... Um, third other category where we're, we're not in a able weird to... zone right we're uh, in a weird yeah. zone where like gray matter yeah people Green, black, and white. love to categorize people either white or black uh -huh. and there's a maybe like a little bit of like the mexican latino side right yeah and then asians are like completely out of the field they're like okay no you are really really different because you have a lot of like latinos that are all that also look white so it's you know white passing Latino, so it look, like it's kind of like ambiguous. But Asian mm -hmm. is like completely like your language is different, you look different. Mm -hmm. We will categorize you so much on the other. Yeah, I mean, and that really kind of separates us from other minorities, and it kind of causes more division instead of more like say we want to fight for minority rights, or say we want to do this. If we're not really like, can we join or can we not join? Or you see us as a minority or not as a minority, it kind of separates groups instead of allows it to be seen together. Like if you want to talk about the history of the model minority stereotype, I mean, even the name model minority means like the rights or the good way to be a minority. Um, the model minority stereotype happened essentially as a counter to the civil rights movement. So while African Americans were asking for more rights, they were asking for equal treatment, and if they were at, they were talking about discrimination, they like the Americans used, well, look at these Asians, they're not white and they are not treated equally, but they're not complaining, they're obedient, they follow the rules, they they're not rioting, they're not fighting back. When, so when did that when did Asian, you coin that term? When when did that start coming out as a counter to you know the black movement? Right, yeah, right around the time of the Civil Rights Movement. Oh, I remember, I think uh, yeah. Time Magazine was the first one that said the model minority. Right, right, right. And so focusing on the success or the obedience of Asian Americans right. wasn't used as a compliment to Asians, but it was used as a counter or an insult to African Americans. Using so Asians Asian as a tool to, you know, yes. tell them, hey, you know, sit back down. You know, if you didn't complain so much, you would be successful like we are. And of course, you know, yeah, exactly. as, as a, you know, Asians living in North America with, with, with the chance to doing this podcast show with, with our dynasty fan base, we have to actually, you know, set some of these things straight here. It's like this, this model minority thing, it's kind of BS to us because we got to let people know, like, it's not really real. It's not really true. This was yeah, a made a up thing. This was a made up thing that they coin us with to counter the black movement, but also kind of to kind of to keep us down too, in a way, because think about all the Asians who are not rich, who are not like, Oh, you know, these new Chinese immigrants or these new Hong Kong immigrants, you know, they come over here with money. What about like second generation, third generation, fourth generation, whatever, fifth generation Asian Americans or ones that are coming from, you know, not as good of a background as other Asians, maybe South Asians mm -hmm. or maybe Southeast Asians, you know, they're struggling just as hard as any other group out there, you know, struggling. They also live in the ghettos. 
how are you going to tell them that they're a model minority? Because they're not. So yeah. it's mm-hmm. like painting yeah, exactly. all Asians with the same brush with the same stereotypical brush, like you were saying. Um, so, mm-hmm. you know, back to your back to your your paper, your your thesis, your your sorry, my bad, your dissertation, whatever you call yeah, it. Yeah, dissertation. Yeah, like tell us what what you found out, man. Like, because w- we're interested to know what you found. Okay. Um, so, in terms of solution base, I think a lot of the problems with where Asian Americans fall is that other category. So, I think through improving race relations, through um, improving um, the view of Asians in America, I think that's the way that improvement and solidarity is going to be achieved. And in terms of the research in particular, um, what I did is that I'm pretty much, if anyone who breaks down a historical analysis of Asian American stereotypes, there's going to be the, and we pretty much talked about them already, um, perpetual foreigner, yellow peril, and um, model minority. So what I did is that my theory is to say that, yeah, these are the three main stereotypes, but not only are just they the three themes related to Asian American males, it's they form a, a, a system, like a cycle, that allows them to support themselves. So just to keep it simple, right? Perpetual foreigner. You need to think that all Asians are the same. You need to think that all Asians you know, um, are these foreign others, that they all look alike, that they all, you know, they have to be homogeneous. Mm-hmm. So they have, to be, they have to be other in order for blanket stereotypes to apply. So first, I mean, that's the, the, the first necessary ingredient is to make them all the same. That's right. professional foreigner. Um, right. And which is, which is why they always go like calling you by a certain racial slur, even though you're not whatever, Chinese, you're not Japanese, but you're actually Korean or whatever, or oh. telling you to go back to China, even though you're not from China, because they, they want to label you all as one central group. It's like they don't mm-hmm. even care that, you know, oh, I'm not Chinese. I'm like Vietnamese or – Yeah, exactly. We totally different. Yeah. So, like okay, are, so, uh, so technique number one is they box you into the one same category, perpetual foreigner, yeah. other, right? And, uh-huh. and, and what else? And then also like, like – okay, so with Asian American masculinity, right? Say they're all foreigners, they're all other, whatever, right? So that fear or the danger of a foreign other is seen as the yellow peril. Um, a bunch of others, a bunch of aliens are coming, right? Well, they might take our jobs, they might take our women, they might take our resources, whatever. That's a threat, right? right. So yellow peril represents the threat of the perpetual foreigner. Um, and in masculinity, right? Um, if we look at stereotypes and in general, I mean, we don't have to chop it all up. It's pretty obvious that Asian American males are either not seen or if they are visible, they're either asexual or the butt of jokes or, or feminine. John. There's Kate yeah. John. John or whatever, right? I so, actually want to slice it right there because I want to talk about this real quick. Well, go ahead. I don't know how long I'm going to take, but. When you when you're talking about the topic of stereotypes, this is where I find I, I find this very interesting. And I'm gonna go out on a limb and say, and I'm just gonna say it. And there's probably gonna be people out there who're gonna you know disagree. I think stereotypes are not real. And I just thought of this the other day because I knew you were gonna talk about this, or or at least we were gonna talk about this at some point in this episode. I just want to get it out there that I don't think stereotypes are actually true. And let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. Okay, being here on on, on planet Earth, being here, living here in Western society, being in the Western Hemisphere for so long, consuming media for so long, and me being a you know a filmmaker as well. So I, I study this kind of stuff. So decades, decades, and decades worth of Hollywood films, Asian films, things like that. I think stereotypes are not real. And the reason why I say that is I'm about to explain my case here. When you tell a lie and you tell it a million thousand times throughout the history of America, and Mm -hmm. of course we're talking about America again, again, not to sound like, you know, we don't like America, obviously 
a lot of us are Asian Americans. A lot of us are Americans. We do enjoy the freedoms of being in America. We do enjoy the good things about America. It's not an America bashing podcast, but you get a very different experience as an Asian person and also as an Asian male, which is why we're talking about this. So what am I talking about when, when I think that when I say that stereotypes are not real? It's because when you look through the history of film, Hollywood films, Western films, you look through the history of television shows, where do these stereotypes come from? So you, you have to like dig. You have to dig back. It's like why is it even a stereotype to begin with? So let's talk about the, the, the most widespread thing that – American media, Hollywood media, Western media has used against Asians and Asian oh, men. Man. Oh, here we go. The, the whole penis thing, the whole uh, penis size thing. Where does that come from? Let's really think about it. It's like, why is that a stereotype? People use the word stereotype to label it as a stereotype, but why is that even labeled a stereotype? Like, roll it back. Where did you get that from? Like, did you do a study in. 1910 when – or sorry, 1885 when the first batch of southern Chinese men coming from Canton, the Canton region and coming from the Fujian region, when they set here on, on California, which they called uh, you know, the Gum San or, or, or the Golden Mountain, when they set foot here and they, they start building the railroads – what did you do? Did you do a study? Did you like line them all up and be like, "Hey, take off your take off all your pants. We're gonna measure like, your, the size of your penises, and that's we're gonna come out with the statistics." Where does that come from? So, to me, as a proud Asian guy or whatever you want to call it, right, that is ridiculous to me. It's like, where does that even come from? Where did that even start? So, Kenji, I want to ask you. You studied this. Did this start anywhere? Did this start somewhere? Did it start in the nineties? Yeah. Did it start in the 80s? What is it? I'd say it started right at the beginning, and I would say um, it's symbolic, and even using language, it's almost literal, castration is the idea of castration. Right. Uh, being able to take the power away of a threat. Right. right. So we have the perpetual foreigners, so they all come in. They're yellow peril, meaning that they're threatening or they're dangerous, right? Right. So, I mean, like, people were like, well, Asians were never seen as sexy or Asians were never seen as sexual. But actually, the fear and the images of yellow peril was this sneaky, magical, or doctor-type Asian guy that kidnapped or raped or attacked white women. So, yeah, it was a negative stereotype, but it was a very, very, very sexual stereotype on purpose because initially Asians were seen as sexual beings. And I have a comment on that, and yeah. this was actually, you know, revealed recently. I don't know, a couple months ago, um, but it was on a social media page. I'm not going to mention the guy's name; it's not important. But he introduced, he, he he dug up a news story of the first Filipino men that came to California yeah. who worked in California. I think they were called the Manongs. I'm not sure. Maybe somebody mm -hmm. could go and fact check that, but. It's basically a news story that came out where the the first Filipino workers that came to California were actually very, very sexual. And they were mm -hmm. very, very sexualized as Asian men. They came, they, this was a very, uh, you know, cool story. Um, so they were all working and obviously they, they were piling up the, you know, as much money as they could. And they were so smart that they pulled together each other's uh, income and they're like, okay, we're going to buy a suit. We're going to buy one suit and we're going to pass it around so we can all share it. So like, uh -huh. you know, 20 or 30 different Filipino guys, it's like, we can only afford one suit. So we're going to buy this one suit and each of us are going to take turns wearing the suit, going into and these musical clubs and, and, and dancing, <laughs> right? Because Filipinos can dance, right? Let, let's stereotype them, right? But anyways, <laughs> no, I mean, like it's a positive thing. So yeah. They were known to be great dancers and, and lovers, and, 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 and white women were taking notice of that. So, so these guys yeah. dressed in these nice suits would be going to these dance clubs, and they would be romancing white women, and they would be sleeping with white women. And historically speaking, what happened afterwards was you know, white men got mad, and, and they got jealous, and 
um, they started actually uh, attacking these Filipino uh, uh, immigrants, these, these, these workers. I think they even had castrations. I think they, they actually had cut castrations. Off their- they wow. attacked them in the middle of the night. They they strung them all up and they were beating their their genitals basically they were beating them up they were beating their genitals and i never knew this you know as a kid growing up i didn't i never heard this story before but it was only until recent times like a couple months ago maybe last year i heard this actual story and it was yeah. it's an actual part of history so you know so that's why i think the whole stereotype thing is not even true i think it's because you know american well I don't want to say all Americans, but I want to say the American media, you know, yeah. the, 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 whoever controls the American media, whoever controls the American movies, you know, they got it. They got the message very early on, you know, 100 years ago that we can't let foreign men have this sexuality about them. Uh, they're going to, you know, they're going to whatever, steal our women, that type of thing. And and. Uh-huh. They have to put these images out, you know, these old comic book images, sorry, these old images where they they drew up like, you know, a yellow peril, like Chinese cartoons, and they make all them make all them look like they're bald. And then they got like a Qing Dynasty, uh, 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 you know, ponytail, and they're all like, you know what I mean, stereotypical Chinese looking, uh, you know, images that they actually manufactured, and they put it out there. It's like, hey, you know. Uh, you know, if you even you look at the, the the history of Hollywood films, you know, if you want to check out this documentary, you know, this is a great documentary. is just mind blowing. It's called The Slanted Screen by uh, Jeff Adachi. Really, really highly recommend anybody listening to this podcast right now. It doesn't matter if you're Asian, you're not Asian, it doesn't matter. Check it out because holy crap, the history of Hollywood films, you just, it blows your mind. Like, you watch it and it's like, wow, over the last hundred years, they've been producing these films that were highly, highly, highly anti-Asian in nature, especially mm-hmm. anti-Asian male. And you didn't even know this stuff existed until you watched this documentary. You might be thinking like, oh, you guys are crazy right now. You guys are like three Asian guys in this uh, podcast. Obviously, you guys are like in an echo room and you're like talking about this stuff. And it's like, oh mm-hmm. – you guys are complaining. You guys whining. No, it's a it's a real reality. Like you, you watch this documentary, a slanted screen documentary. We're not lying to you. Um, the first Hollywood star who was Asian, who was a who was a sex symbol, was Seshu Hayakawa, Japanese American man, and you know women of every color. You know white women, whatever you want to call it, used to fill up the movie theaters to watch him, and then. This was around the, like the 1900s, so he was like a big silent film star, and you know back then it was fine. But then all of a sudden, you know, World War One, World War Two came around, and as a Japanese American, it's like, oh no! All of a sudden, like he's the enemy. Like you got to stop him from from being a big star now. So all of a sudden, like all this propaganda starts coming out, like stuff you mentioned, right? Japanese people are the enemy. The internment camps come along all this yellow peril propaganda coming out and, and, and all of a sudden nobody remember who Seshu Hayakawa was anymore. Mm-hmm. And then you went through this long period of time where there was no Asian American male film star. And we're not talking about Asian American females right now. That's another topic altogether, but mm-hmm. there was no Asian American male film star probably until like when Mako came out uh, and when uh, James Shigeta, <laughs> came out yeah Yeah, and they were like you know in the 70s and 80s and stuff like that and even then nobody you know there were few and far between because they made so many kind of racist yellow sorry yellow face kind of films like charlie chan and all that kind of stuff fu manchu and and uh david carradine whitewashing bruce lee's own role in in kung fu this was like a script that went on right now yeah, no, oh, 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 yeah, you want to talk about right now? No, no, I want to. Well, we'll get to that in a second. Um, oh man, so Bruce Lee wrote the wrote the TV show Kung Fu, and he wrote it, or, or rather, it was his idea, and then uh, the studio stole his idea, and then we're like, you know what? We're gonna whitewash that. We're gonna put David Carradine in that. Gotta put and, someone more marketable. 
or whatever. Their excuse is somebody more marketable. But, but I mean, please, like, I, 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 we're, we're going to get more marketable that. Bruce Lee. We're, we're going to get in that in a bit. But you know, under the excuse of marketability, they're putting in a white person and they're whitewashing these films. And you know, to to a guy like me who can completely see through all that because I study film and all that type of stuff. I'm like, this is just ridiculous, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's so it's almost so obvious that it is racially motivated because you don't want the Asian male to be seen as a superstar. You don't want the Asian male to be seen as sexy. And mm -hmm. this, like you said, it, it 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 it's really, really, really rooted, you know, in history way back. And it's still today, it is not over by and and in some cases it's actually worse. Mm -hmm. Um and a lot of viewers out there, whoever's listening, yeah, things are not getting better. Things are actually getting worse because China is a superpower now and they're like, oh, you know, all that stuff is coming back out of the woodwork. It's like, okay. Remember the nineties, man? Remember the nineties where it used to be like Mortal Kombat and Robin Show was in there and he was <laughs> like Liu Kang. And then you had um uh, sorry, I, f I forgot his full name. Uh, Kiri, Kiri, Kiri Toku, Hiroyuki Tokugawa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that that gentleman. He was a Shang Tsung, and mm -hmm. like, oh my God, there's actually an Asian hero and, a, and actually an Asian villain. And and uh, today, 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 Liu Kang would be a white dude. Yeah, so, today yeah. Liu Kang would be a white dude, right? Like, like, like they would just put him in there for no reason, right? So Zac Efron. Yeah, the Zac Efron. Why not? Uh, <laughs> uh, you, you know, um, but or Magic Mike. You know, whoever, whoever plays Magic Mike. But anyways, so remember the '90s when when China wasn't a superpower yet. You had like Eddie Ray's Jr. in there yeah. as a pizza delivery boy. I mean, he wasn't the main he, character, but <laughs> at least he was a good side character to the Ninja Turtles. You know what I mean? Um, you had like Mortal Kombat. You had Jungle Book. You had at least when Bruce yeah, Lee was alive. Yeah. Yeah, at least when when Bruce Lee was still alive. Obviously, you had a bunch of Bruce Lee movies that changed the world. Obviously. Um, Brandon was gone. Yeah, and 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 you know, and you know, even the Hong Kong uh, celebrities that came over in the '90s. Jackie Chan had his run. Jet Li had his run. Obviously, yeah. they're too old now, and they returned home. Donnie Yen popped in a little bit earlier in the 2000s. Nobody really caught caught him, and then mm. now he's having another a late career resurgence. You know, Star well, I don't, wanna, I don't want to say resurgence. He's actually, you know, finally reached that legendary status where he can his name can be spoken in the same sentence as Bruce Lee, Jet Li, and Jackie Chan over in the East, and and he picked up that popularity and then went all the way over back back to Hollywood. You know, doing a couple of Hollywood films now. Is he going to get a couple of solo films? I hope because, you know, it's kind of his time. It's kind of now or never. Yeah. But uh, anyway, going back to the Dude. topic of stereotypes, we know it's embedded in history. We know that shit is not real. That's why I say, I'm telling you right now, stereotypes are not real because when have you ever fact-checked that stuff? It, it's literally one lie on top of one lie on top of one lie on top of another lie. And, and I can present it to you like, okay, the next time somebody comes up with that stupid joke oh you know laughing at asian penises or whatever it's like okay dude have you how many asian penises have you seen in your life you know what i mean like you know what i mean like why are you so, why are you so interested in my penis you know what i mean what makes you an asian penis expert hmm? Hmm? i mean i have a good one like if they, if they start talking about that like if they want to refer to like porn or like media for that then you could just say well i mean do you guys have trouble getting it up? Because all you guys are on Viagra commercials, so I guess, you know. Yeah. <laughs> or why are you so interested in, you know, my penis? Is it because, you know what I mean? Like, I mean, whatever. Like, you're probably homosexual or whatever. But, I mean, I'm not using homosexual in terms of a way to – as a derogatory, you know, term for, for, for people who are gay. But literally, I'm saying, like, why are you so interested in my penis? You know what like, I mean? Why do you care about it more than I care? <laughs> yeah, why do you care about it more than I care about it? But anyways, so – the other, the foreigner, perpetual foreigner, added with yellow peril, added with these fake stereotypes, like I was saying, these fake stereotypes. And what else? Well, pretty much, um, yeah, I'm, I totally agree, by the way, that I believe that stereotypes are socially constructed. 
and they're socially constructed with a motive or with an agenda or an underlying message that the stereotype is trying to propagate. And and the funny thing now, now that you reminded me, a lot of these people nowadays who are ignorant, who don't really know what's going on behind the scenes in Hollywood or whatever. I mean, not that I'm saying like, hey, I'm an expert and I got an inside source and I know that, hey, these guys are doing it on purpose or whatever. But what I'm saying is a lot of people – They'll come up with the, the the reasoning behind like oh whitewashing and you know they mm-hmm. cast you know these kinds of Asians and they show these stereotypes and they're saying oh it's because you know Asian stars aren't bankable. Mm-hmm. Let me just stop that right there and and just say that's complete, hundred percent bullshit. Because I'll tell you why you can't have Asian stars if you don't cast them in the roles in the first place. That's point number one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So when people say, oh, there's no Asian stars, that's why you know these movies get whitewashed because these Hollywood producers and these Hollywood execs are just trying to protect their investment. I can come up with plenty of examples that debunk this, and it's a myth. Okay, Go run it back. Bruce Lee, international superstar. He did tons mm-hmm. of money at the box office. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jet Li – uh, maybe not every single one of his Hollywood films were hits, but at least they weren't like box office bombs. As far as mm-hmm. I'm concerned, Romeo Must Die was very popular. Um, some of his international movies that got ported over to the States, for example, Hero, uh, Danny the Dog, a.k.a. Unleashed, um, Kiss the Dragon didn't do so bad either. Um, Fearless. Fearless. You know, these were all hits, box office hits. Mm-hmm. Uh Obviously, Jackie Chan is a box office hit. Plenty of examples where you you have Asian stars who are hits. And then you want to talk about Asian American stars. Well, yeah, there's plenty of Asian American stars you could choose from. Uh, William Lee is one of them. Uh, Kung Lee is one of them. I don't know. Name me a a couple more. But I'm sure – I mean John Cho, right? Steven Yoon. You can start naming them. But Steven Yoon. I want to talk about Steven Yoon first. Okay, sure. Go ahead. Okay, so this guy, Walking Dead, fan fanatic, like fan favorite. When he when he dies in the series, you know people start stop watching the show, right? Because they obviously yeah. loved him. He's had all these photo ops, like him and his female co-star was it Lauren Cohen. They're on like these like picture picture shoots, photo shoots, looking like a perfect couple. Like obviously a fan favorite. People asking like, well, is he gonna die? You know, I've been hearing people asking like, you know, about his because they care about his character, right? So when he finally goes, you know. Usually, uh, someone with that kind of presence, after he leaves the show, he's going to get like tons of offers, right? Right. Yeah. But yeah. from what I've read, apparently from like Bobby Lee, Bobby Lee like saw him in line for some like two-bit roles, and he was saying how Stephen Yoon, a person like an actor of his caliber, should not be in audition for these type of parts. And reading that, like I wasn't all too surprised, but it's just really sad to me. Like he should mm-hmm. really be like, if he was in any other race, I guarantee you he would be in line for like like a strong supporting app, supporting role in like the next superhero film or even leading man contention. Cause that right. guy, that guy delivers. Okay. Right. And, and yeah. they should to him, but instead he still has to like go for their leftovers. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And you know, people are, 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 you know, Hollywood producers make this excuse. Like, you know, these stars aren't bankable. You know, point number one is you can't make a star without actually casting an Asian person in there in the first place. Right. And then point number two and this one really gets me, or rather should debunk this whole thing, is that the typically the role that they whitewash or they put the white actor in there is not any more famous than the Asian actor that you could have put in there, right? So, for example, Gods of Egypt. Uh, who, who? Okay, I understand Gerard Butler was was the villain or whatever, but I can't name who was the guy who played whatever the 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 protagonist of that film i can't name it can you name it Uh, i can't name it uh so i don't know yeah but but apparently (laughs) it's gods of egypt but with white people in it and you know whatever um you had like what was that other film that ridley scott directed no 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 the one that ridley scott directed it was uh again it was another movie about egyptians but it had like freaking uh christian bale in it as like yeah 
one of the Egyptian gods or something. Uh, the Moses one or something? Or yeah, yeah, the, the Moses one or Exodus, something. Exodus, Exodus, yeah. Exodus. Exodus, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kings and gods or whatever, right? And then the yeah. only, the only like black person or the only African person in there was like a slave or whatever. Like you're telling <laughs> me, you're telling me, there are no bankable African American stars. Mm-hmm. Uh, that that theory doesn't really work, right? So you go back to you know, films that are supposed to star Asians in them that get whitewashed, so many blatant examples, right? So Avatar, Last Airbender, even if you go back to the anime, Mm -hmm. all the heroes, all the good guys were Asians and people of color and stuff like that, right? And and all the bad guys in the anime happened to be, like, white, right? Mm -hmm. So when they made it into a live-action film, because now it's live-action with real actors – real people they're like oh wait wait a second we can't do that like we 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 can't have white people seen as like the bad people so they switched the whole thing and then they cast brown people and and whoever else right people of color as the bad guys and then all of a sudden all the asian heroes are now white like that is so blatant right you can't you can't come up to me and tell me like no you're wrong bro like they did it because those white actors were famous and they were they they guaranteed star power okay who was the guy that played you know who who's the guy that played uh, uh the, the last airbender i don't know his name you mean, movie bomb by the way yeah that's yeah. what i'm saying that's what i'm saying so i don't know any of those white actors so those actors are in, not any more or less famous than if you just cast asian people in there and then that debunks the whole thing of people saying, oh, they, they cast more famous white people in there. That's because they're trying to protect their box office, uh, you know, returns. That's not true at all. Because every time you put in a whitewashed role and people see through that, that film actually ends up being a bomb. So that's your evidence right there. So Last Airbender, Avatar, right? What else? Dragon Ball Evolution. Well, anyways, Dragon Ball Evolution, the film itself was horrible. Like, let's, 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 let's get that out of the way. The film itself was horrible. But to add on top of that, you put in some guy named Chatwin something. I don't know who, what his name is. Oh, but the Asian females, they could stay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Asian females can stay, though. You know what I mean? But we're not going to get Asian into that because that, that's a whole other topic. That's a whole other topic. Like, like that's that. We're, we're going to, like, do a freaking, like, eight-hour episode on that one. But anyways, so freaking Dragon Ball, you have another no-name random white guy in there. It's like, okay, now you just made the movie even worse. And what else is there? Okay, so Twenty One, that oh, movie man. where it was it was literally about Asian American MIT students. They were all Asian American. My dad knew those guys. And the, and the professor, your, your dad knew those guys. Yeah, he knew them. He knew yeah, them. And, and the professor himself was Asian as well. So it was a yeah. Asian American story, right? You could have presented <laughs> this story where they 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 were counting blackjack tables, right? At, at MIT students. You could have presented the story purely as an Asian American story. I wouldn't even be upset if you inserted a couple of other people in there that weren't Asian just for diversity, just to mix it up, right? You, maybe you inserted a Latino guy. Maybe you inserted a white person or you inserted a black person just to include other people in there. I wouldn't have been – I wouldn't have had a problem with that. That's fine. You modify it a little bit, spice it up. That would have been fine. But it ends up being like, okay, the main character is a white guy. And there's all of a sudden an Asian female in there, and then there's all there's a sidekick who's an Asian guy in there. But like, wait a well, second, quick, this quick is not a white person story. Quick point on the sidekick. So that was played by Aaron Yu, right? Right. Aaron Yu was a guy. So he actually came to my school when I was back at college at University of Pennsylvania. He came to talk about the movie. No, it was like packed full of Asian Americans, kind of going goo goo gaga over this guy because he was like a celebrity and all that. At the end of the question uh, question session, I actually raised my hand and asked him about the whitewashing. I was like, "Are you know, like people saying that this movie is whitewashed? Like, what do you think about that?" And before that, no one had even considered asking it this question. Like, it was like, kind of like the elephant in the room, but no mm-hmm. one ever like really considered it. It's like all these Asian American kids like turned around, looked at me, like, "Oh, what the hell is this guy doing? Like, who is this guy? Like, why is he asking this? That's just so rude." And I asked him, and then he kind of like. He had like a kind of like a cocky kind of attitude about it. He was like, "Oh well, you know, it's definitely not racist. You know, like the you know like the producers are all like cool and stuff." And then he and then the kicker was like he was I think it was like the producer or the writer or someone. He was like, "Oh, he has an Asian wife." 
Oh, that's why he's not yes. Racist. As we all like, know, I... that is the get out of jail free card here in America. As long as you're dating somebody, uh, you know, of a different ethnicity than you, then automatically, you know, you, oh, yeah, you, yeah. you, you know, you can be yeah. absolved oh, of all crimes of Absolutely. being racist, right? And that's that's exactly how it works. No, yeah. no. In reality, that's not how it works, right? So, and it is fully capable within the human being to be dating someone, such as you're dating someone of a different ethnicity, you can still harbor racist feelings towards their, their, their ethnicity. It doesn't mean that, oh, just because you're dating them, that means you can't possibly be racist at all. That's simply not true. Um, mm -hmm. And that's just that's not just me talking out of my ass. I mean... I mean, well, I mean, we're, we're, we're going to go I into like heavy, respect, heavy right? territory here. We're going to we're going to get into like interracial dating, interracial marriages, and and ooh, that's, not, that's, not, ooh, that's, 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 that's a, that's a bit deep. So I think we should put that off for now. Let's save that for a little bit later. So Kenji, wrap it up. How did this whole thing? What 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 do you have to say to our our podcast viewers here, our podcast listeners here? Well, I think I think the main thing is that if we talk about perpetual foreigner, we talk about yellow peril. I think the 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 model minority stereotype is the main thing that actually is subtly keeping it all together. Because if you treat everyone like you're an alien, there's going to be results. If you are afraid and have negative stereotypes of Asians, there's going to be results. But the thing about the model minority stereotype does is it kind of mollifies or it kind of pacifies anything that would be directly negative and kind of makes it just barely acceptable when they're like, oh, well, we're treated badly or we're treated different, but at least we got this, or at least we, we come this far, or at least there's something good that comes out of it. So I think it's the model minority stereotype that slowly and subtly allows the system to continue. And without the model minority stereotype, it would just be rejected or fought against. But the fact that there's like this subtle pacification that allows it to continue. Right, right, right. And and this brings up a very good point. This brings up a very good point to our listeners who are listening in, um, whether you, you may be Asian or not Asian or whatever. What, what comes out of this is, have you ever noticed that anti-Asian kind of racism is looked at as acceptable in American mm -hmm. society, it's not like it's not. It's totally not even the same thing as if you were like, for example, racist against a black person. Then, mm -hmm. oh my God, automatically it's like huge red you flags. You know, you huge know. red flags. You can't say anything like that. You know, they've been through a lot. You know, slavery, all that type of stuff. Like automatically, you're fired from your job. That type of thing. But if you're racist against an Asian person, largely that is ignored. Largely that is swept under the rug. Largely, it's okay. And, yeah. you know, as an Asian person, as an Asian male, as a proud Asian male who's aware of these kinds of things, I have to let my viewers know, like, that stuff is not okay. And mm -hmm. and especially when people react to, uh, 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 you know, us speaking up, right? When we speak mm -hmm. up, a lot of these viewers or a lot of these people on the internet, you know, they're like, oh, you guys just stop complaining. You guys are whining. You guys are a bunch of SJWs, blah, 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 blah. Dude. Like, stop sweeping it under the rug here. Let's yeah. let's let's uh, face the facts here. You can be racist against an Asian person in America, you know, in 2017, and largely you will get a pass for it. It's not mm -hmm. like HR is going to come knocking to your door. It's like, hey, uh, you told uh, you told a uh, uh, Gurjeet over there at your floor that uh, his 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 lunch stinks, and you mm -hmm. know you know that, that's against uh, you know. Our policy and you know we're gonna fire you no nobody cares about Gurjeet's feelings no nobody cares about that guy that asian guy you know in the it department's feelings like there's simply not enough numbers right you can make the argument oh you know asian american populations only about whatever three percent or five percent or i don't know reaching up to ten percent of the population you guys simply don't have enough uh numbers for us to care which is exactly mm -hmm. the problem and then mm -hmm. you have things like yellow peril you have things like model minority coming in to make racism okay because mm -hmm. oh you Asians are privileged anyways like you Asians yeah, are rich you mm -hmm. Asians you know have more privilege than us whatever it is like we can make fun of you because we know you can take it or whatever it is I don't know what it is right but that's the weird thing about living in America is that 
making fun of Asian people is is okay. It's allowed. It's mm-hmm. encouraged. It's like a normal thing. And you know, my message is, it's not okay. It's not cool. Like we're not perpetual foreigners. We are human beings. We've been here since 1880. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, you know, going through four or five generations of being in America, we're still seen as like, oh, where'd you come from? That type of Mm -hmm. thing. And, you know, it's disrespectful. Right. And people should be, uh, you know, aware of that. People who maybe don't have Asian friends or maybe have one Asian friend and they don't really know how to interact with that Asian person. Well, be open minded. You know what I mean? Don't be so closed minded. And, yeah, don't 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 get tricked by the mainstream media and start uh, you know categorizing your Asian friends in, in in a box because there's a lot of Asians out there and each different Asian carries a different set of experiences and yeah. we're not all the same. We're all human beings. We have emotions. We have feelings. So you know, eventually, as the Asian population grows, you're you're just gonna have to learn that like, hey, we're we're here as Amer- Asian Americans as well, or Asian Canadians, or whatever it is, and you know, let's coexist, right? Like it's, it's, you know, that's, that's really it. So uh, the weird thing is I find that Asian racism, like racism against Asians is, is largely acceptable in, in Western society. And, and uh, you know, thanks for sharing us, you know, with your findings. Yeah. So, I mean, back on the minor model minority thing. So obviously the biggest problem with that, as you know, was already mentioned is that kind of the, the thought that every Asian group is the same, that every Asian group, you know, kind of has the same kind of privileges, so to speak. Yeah. Like they think, you know, Chinese, recent Chinese immigrants in Vancouver are rich, but then you say also recent, but then you also have the recent Chinese immigrants who are poor in restaurants. So you kind of have to kind of like balance those. And then you have like the Southeast Asians who are not doing, you know, as well socioeconomically compared to like other Asian groups, like maybe Korean Americans, or Japanese Americans. So that's the main problem. The main issue is that everyone is thought of as the same. Everyone doesn't deserve the same protections. Mm-hmm. Spe- speaking from a healthcare pers- perspective, you think all Asians are healthy. You think all Asians can afford health insurance. You think they all have, I guess, the same, you know, disabilities that apply to them. Like, you know, hepatitis is more common in Asian communities. But you also have, like, some groups which have higher instances of certain diseases. So it's all a matter of just, like, rounding us all as the same and that's really the core of the model minority myth and why it's so harmful to us and obviously a side effect of that is that we're not we're not even seen as minorities because you know like see that mm-hmm. you see like the rich chinese people rolling around in like benzes living in mansions you don't think of them as minorities right you don't think of them as dealing with the same issues that you know like blacks deal with like inner city people deal mm-hmm. with so you automatically classify them as you know and that's kind of the thing going back to I guess another aspect of media. Uh, so recently, you know, the movie Get Out. Mm-hmm. So Get Out has been, you know, a huge hit. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously tackling some important issues about racism. One issue, I mean, I haven't personally seen it. I don't know if you guys have. I haven't but, seen it yet. Uh, Not yeah. yet. So yeah. I guess our viewpoint on it will be maybe slightly biased, but uh, go ahead anyway. Well, I mean, I haven't seen it either, but I just heard that there was like a depiction of one Asian male in there. And he yeah. was depicted as like the minor, model minority type. I see. And I mean, part of that could be, you know, just the way that, like, there's just different ways to approach that, in my opinion. I feel like, I mean, some of it could be, like, the fault, so to speak, of Asians. Maybe not, like, maybe kind of some Asians tend to embrace the model, model minority. As mm-hmm. a model minority myth, they don't really go out of their way to, you know, challenge it. They're basically, you know, they're resigned to just, oh, yeah, you know, we're, you know, we're kind of like, kind of like white people, you know, we don't have to deal with the same issues. We can side with them. We don't have to side with like inner city people or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Try to distance themselves. From, keep like, it the to them. They keep it to minorities. themselves, right? They don't right, say much. Right. So right. B- because well, of the, the culture, other, yeah. because of the Asian culture, you know, we're naturally kind of keep it to ourselves. Don't be so loud about things. Don't be so, you know, rock on the boat type things. We kind of, yeah. uh, you know, mind our own yeah. business. Yeah. You add that plus the lack of media representation, Right. Because the only roles that, you know, they'll let Asian people get, as we've you know talked about, are the stereotypical, uh, you know, racist kind of roles where, you know, we're depicted in, in one exact way with very, very little room for any other alternate 
uh, depictions, like for example, a romantic Asian man that's not a martial artist. Like, how many roles are there in that? You know, does that get offered? Not much. Like one example is Stephen Yoon, and the other example is Daniel Day Kim. That's probably it. You know, that's probably yeah. it. So you combine those couple things, not not much representation, and plus naturally Asians are just going to keep it to ourselves. And then you have this thing where it's like, okay, I'm going to assume that Asians are like this, and you know, there yeah. you go. And then another point about that, like, at the same time, like, it's really, like, I really have, really kind of offended by that, you know, like, the Get Out depiction, you know, it's a, a black produced film, right. you know, talking about racism in America, and yet they depict Asians as kind of like cronies of whites, like, it really, it just really seems really unsettled. You yeah, know? like, actually, it's, it's not like, the fault of, it's yeah. just really, like, I feel kind of, like, ow, like, really, like, that's how you guys see us, too? Like, yeah, it, it's like, like you know, not, we're already dealing with, you know, the racism coming in from Hollywood, which, you know, exactly. should come, come to no surprise to our listeners by now. If, if you're still not convinced uh, about that, you know, I don't really know what to say other than maybe this podcast is not for you. But, um, you know, we're dealing with the Hollywood racism coming from mainly white people. Then Asians also have to deal with the racism coming from black people now too. So with the jokes that Chris Rock right. pulled out at the Oscars, yeah. making fun of Asians, like doing the whole Oscar so white thing, trying to you know stand up for black people, but then using Asians as scapegoats to step on us, that's ridiculous. So I lost mm -hmm. all respect for that guy. You know, I don't find that's him about funny. To, that's about to Steve Harvey, what he said about Asian men. Yeah, Asian Steve men. Harvey, what he said about Asian men, same thing. It's like, all right, Steve Harvey, like. You're you're fighting for you know your your black representation and you're pro black and all that, but you had to step on Asians. It's like what's up with that? So for mm -hmm. for for Asians, it's almost like okay, you can't catch any breaks. You know, it's like the white Hollywood system is against you. Then there are the people, the black people who are now in positions of power to create their own media, and they're against you too. <laughs> so yeah it's, it's almost certain, like it's almost like man we're we're boxed in and uh you know we're we're kind of taking it from all sides so to speak but obviously not to paint everybody with that same brush i mean sure there are people out there you know white people black people whatever latinos who are obviously you know they do care about asian issues they they are our allies in in some ways but you know it, it also it's also disappointing when people you know pop up and people that maybe you used to be fans of, people that maybe you were like, oh, yeah, that that person's really entertaining. And then you find out like, oh, they did this racist movie before or they went out and said this about Asians or they went and did this. So it, it actually brings up another interesting topic is like there have been a lot of Hollywood stars that have been involved in movies, movie productions – that are actually all subtly anti-Asian and and apparently you know racist and it, 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 and 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 I I'm taking this chance to bring this up because I as a as a connoisseur of films this really disappoints me right watching Hollywood films for example a guy like Bradley Cooper pops up and it's like oh all of a sudden now I remember Bradley Cooper did that really racist hang a uh, Hangover film mm -hmm. and now all of a sudden no matter what movie bradley cooper does i can't see him in the same way anymore you know what i mean he goes and does the movie whatever american sniper whatever i've not watched it i'm not american if you're american and you watched it and you really love that movie great all the power to you i don't really have anything to say everything that i've heard about the movie is just propaganda you know american propaganda pro-war type stuff but anyways not to be america bashing or anything like that but it's not a movie for me, right? And if Bradley Cooper's in it, that's that's a double no for me because he involved himself with a movie like The Hangover, which is with, with a character like Mr. Chow and, and Ken Jeong in it, oh, who is probably the worst uh, Asian-American representative the worst. Uh, in, in the history of representing Asian-Americans in media. Ken Jeong probably is on the top of the list here. I can't think of anybody else who is as much of a sellout uh, to his own people, so to speak, as, as he would be. Uh, you know, Bobby Lee is definitely up there, but Bobby Lee, Bobby Lee never had that, you know, mainstream household name type thing 
but Ken Jong is like, you know, the worst example in, in, in representing Asian Americans, stepping us back, you know, 50 years with his, uh, you know, so-called acting roles and stuff like that. And, I, and I'm not here to like, oh, let's bash this person on this, you know, little podcast that we have and, 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 and act like a bunch of, uh, you know, salty uh, whiners or whatever. I'm not trying to throw them under the bus. I'm just trying to say it like it is. If, if, you're, a Ken, if you're a Ken Jong fan... And you're an, you're an Asian person and you're a Ken Jeong fan, there's something wrong with you. There's something really, really wrong with you. I'm just going to I'm just gonna say that out there right now. Like, there's something wrong with you because Ken Jeong is not a positive role model whatsoever. A lot of the stuff that he does, self-deprecating humor, whatever, I don't find it funny. I'm not trying to be, like, angry or offended at, at the things that he does. I'm not, like, a whiny person. I'm not a picky person. I'm not a petty person. I'll watch something that's entertaining. I'll watch something that's comedic. Right, I'll, I can accept that. If it's genuinely funny, it's genuinely funny. But the stuff that Ken Jong does is not the stuff that you do as a comedian, where you laugh with the comedian. People are laughing because they're laughing at him, not laughing with him. They're laughing at him, and he's doing all of his roles that are like extremely degrading to Asians, extremely degrading to Asian men, and people are laughing at him not laughing alongside him uh you you see other uh, and people are going to come up with this defense i know what you guys are thinking people are going to our listeners are going to come up with a defense oh but it's comedy it's supposed to be funny all right sure you can be funny without racially degrading yourself right you can be like ice cube or you can be kevin hart you know you can be will ferrell you can still make fun of yourself in in these funny situations but that's not the same level of the making fun of yourself as Ken Jong does. Like Will Ferrell can make fun of himself. He, he can run around, you know, half naked and all that type of stuff because he's, he's a funny, you know, fat guy and that's okay. But that, that's not tied to the fact that he's white. It's just exactly. tied. To, it's only tied to the fact that he's playing a funny character. <laughs> Kevin Hart, you know, makes fun of himself, deprecating, self-deprecating humor. You know, he's a short black guy or whatever it is, but it's never against black people. It just happens that he's a short guy, and he, he appears in these funny scenarios. But with Ken Jong, it's never like separated. The difference is with Ken Jong, it's never separated. He is funny because he's self-deprecating because he is a useless, whiny Asian male with a micro penis who you can never take him seriously, and he's always useless, and he's effeminate. So that's yeah, always this, tied can, to. Can, can I mention? Can I mention this guy as a doctor? He's supposed to be like a very educated man, and he's making himself look like a fool. That's... Right. And mm -hmm. you know, and that's the saddest thing of it of it all because he's so aware of this, right? And anybody who's listening to the to the podcast, if you know Ken Jong, hey, you can tell him to check us out, right? And and I'm sure he knows, right? He's a smart guy, so he knows exactly what he's doing, right? It's not like he's stupid. He's just selling out to Hollywood, right? And, and getting paid for it, but at the expense of Asian Americans everywhere. And um, actually, before we, we, we uh, leave this episode off today, I, I, I want to kind of do this as to set this as a precedent for uh, each episode. I'm going to introduce to our listeners, uh, you know, our Asian names and what they mean. So we can kind of share our culture a little bit. So my name is, uh, you know, in, in Cantonese, it's Ho Hoi Wa. So, uh, hoi wa ho, and the meaning for that is hoi means uh, victorious. So hoi is the, uh, the 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 I hope I'm saying this correctly in French. It's a uh, lark de triomphe. <laughs> That's probably horrible sounding, but uh, it, it's it's the the victory gates, the gates of victory. So hoi is is sailing far. And being a hero and coming back and being revered as a hero, so so heroic. Uh, hoi wa just means a wa. It means a Chinese. So heroic Chinese person is 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 my name. So Kenji, why don't you tell us what your name means, if there's a meaning? Yeah, well, Kenji. Um, my parents wanted to give me a Japanese name, so they went through a book to try to find something for me that started with K, because my dad wanted to call me KJ. Um, and they found uh, when I was in my mom's stomach, I kicked a lot and I moved a lot. So Kenji actually means active boy or like a, a boy with a lot of energy. 
is what Kenji means. Sweet. And when uh, is there any uh, certain uh, meaning to your last name at all or no? Uh, Miyamoto, I think it means base of the mountain or base of the temple. Some, something about foundation. Oh, what but an interesting – yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, well, the thing is is that my family is originally from Kumamoto, and that's where Miyamoto Musashi, the samurai, was from or, right, or right, right. were buried too. Right. So we like to, like, imagine that we have this connection to Miyamoto from Kumamoto. Right, right. And I actually heard of this thing – I don't know if this is true or not. I actually heard it from someone. Again, I could be completely wrong. But apparently mm -hmm. Japanese last names come from the place that either your yeah. parents or your ancestors procreated and conceived you. Or rather, <laughs> that's the place that they banged in order to yeah. make you. Is that true at all? <laughs> Man, you are really interested in my family banging. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, just because Japanese people bang a lot. <laughs> No, I mean, Japanese people should bang more because, you know, their know, population know. is dwindling. But uh, is there any truth to that at all? Is, is, is that truly yeah, where yeah. they bang? A lot of last names were tied to either occupation or location or geography, like, say, base of the mountain, right? It sounds kind of cool, like, oh, structural foundation, but maybe my family actually literally was, like, at the bottom of a mountain, like, at the base of the mountain, right, you know? Right, right, right. So there could be geography or location or... or like job or whatnot. Right. And Liang, what about your name? Well, my name is uh, Liang Dewei. So Liang is my surname. Uh, Dewei. So De, the De and that is actually part of the Chinese name for Germany because I was actually born in Germany. Huh. Um, my parents are studying there. So uh, De Guo is Chinese, is Chinese for Germany. And uh, the De is from there. And then Wei is just... Uh, I believe it also means to preserve. So do can also mean like virtue and to preserve. So I guess you can make you tie that into preserving virtue. You nice. Know, make it a meaning. Wow. So. Nice, man. Actually, because of the Dynasty podcast, you got the, the two guests I have with, with me right now, you guys are both, you guys both train martial arts. So Kenji, why don't you tell a little bit about your martial arts uh, background, your history and your training? Um, let's see. Well, I've done karate. Uh, I've done martial arts pretty much my whole life since I was like around 10. Um, I've done Which karate. karate? karate. <laughs> Gosoku Ryu. Gosoku Ryu. Um, out of IKA uh, Kubota. Um, so nice. Kubota came to Glendale and he established the International Karate Association. So I'm affiliated through IKA. The train was uh, Victor Chico. So I've done a Gosoku Karate for about like mm, over 10, 15 years. Got my black belt through there. But I also just cross train um, at Defiant MMA. So I train uh, Muay Thai and a little BJJ, uh, a couple of Muay Thai smokers, but pretty much stick to just base karate with cross training for fun, just as a hobby. Cool, man. Cool. Liang, uh, cool. what do you do? So not as decorated, but uh, amateur boxer for around four or so years, training here out of uh, Team Norfolk Boxing Club in Norfolk, Virginia. Nice. Um, competing in a few, competing in a few matches, uh, just to get my feet wet with martial arts, you know, boxing. Uh, Never really delved into grappling. Maybe that's something to do in the future. But right now, just trying to trying to work on my hands. Yeah, sure, yeah. man. And how how did you guys get into martial arts? Like, what you know prompted you to 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 do it? I think for me, I mean, it was it's directly connected to identity, connected directly to male role models, connected directly to you know whether it be Bruce Lee or Jackie Chan or whatever, knowing as an Asian male that it was something I was interested in. <laughs> so you just you just saw them and then you're like, okay, I want to do it. Is that, is that what it was? Yeah, yeah. I mean, growing up, you know, maybe a short guy complex too. I don't know. Okay. I just okay. Yeah, okay. I always wanted to do martial arts. <laughs> right. And you you just basically found a karate gym or were, were Actually, you? My very, my very first uh, martial art was Hapkido. Okay. First. And you yeah. went to the gym yourself, or like did a pa did a parent or did a relative introduce it to you or something like that? Uh, I wanted I wanted to, so my parents helped me find one that was nearby. Cool, so, cool. And, and yeah. what about yourself, Liang? So basically, just started watching them. Like when I started watching like mixed martial arts, realized there are a lot of like great, amazing Asian athletes in there. Started following their careers. Started watching the videos on YouTube. And started thinking, maybe maybe I can, you know, try it out. I'm not too old yet. Maybe I can, like, start to try to figure out how to do some of this stuff. And then, like, realized that MMA was maybe a little bit too much for me to handle all at once. So I wanted to start out with some boxing first. I feel like it was the more, more simple, pure sport for me right now at the moment. 
uh, started training in it, like learning how to hit the bag, like just following like, YouTube tutorials. And then actually when I started med school here, I found the gym. They apparently train a lot of like junior national champions, potential Olympians. So went over there and actually started training for real when at once I was already in med school. So been kind of trying to learn the ropes, kind of as an older guy in there getting, you know, right. getting my ass handed to me by these little kids. But, right. Yeah, and you yeah, started okay. like in your 20s, right? Doing boxing, right? right. Yeah, on only boxing so far. Yeah. yeah. So, like, how did you, how how did that change? How, like, did martial arts change you in any way? And, and 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 yeah, tell us about that. Yeah. So I mean, before martial arts or before boxing, I was powerlifting. I was more of a like a lifter type. Like, did powerlifting competitions, could deadlift a lot. Was like wow. pretty pretty built. I mean, so, like, no one would really, like, I guess, mess with me or consider me an easy target on the street. Right. But the thing is, like, I always felt there was something lacking. Like, what if I did get into a confrontation? Like, what would right. I do? I would just be, like, this, right? So I kind of wanted to be useful in those kind of situations, have the extra confidence. And then after learning boxing, after learning how to handle, you know, sparring, full contact sparring, like, how basically, basically defend yourself through basic punches, you know, like, I kind of do have an idea of what to do now, so I'm no longer really fearful of getting into such confrontations. Right. But I feel like I'm also smarter about it. Like, I don't feel I can bully myself. I mean, bully other people with, like, kind of my size or appearance because now I, like, lost all of it. I don't even look like I lift anymore. <laughs> right, right, but, right. But, like, if I do get into a confrontation, I feel like I know what to do. Yeah, man. And, uh, you know, Kenji has martial arts. Would you say martial arts has shaped your life as well? I know oh, it, yeah. I know it definitely shaped my life. Yeah, I mean, I would think both in terms of self-confidence and self-esteem. Right. I think it definitely makes me feel grounded. It makes me proud. It makes me not afraid. Right. So it's something that I take pride in. And even karate, um, for example, like, uh, I would train and then go through periods of not training. And then when I was, like, in high school to college, I would jump from a different school when I moved. Right. So it was something I kind of started but then never finished. So for right. me to get my black belt – was kind of symbolic. It was like something that I started but never finished. Right. So actually kind of continuing that journey and keeping it going was a challenge for me instead of something that you just start and stop, start and stop. It's something that you have to continue and push yourself. And then uh, I think even just in psychology as a therapist, a lot of what I've learned about people or a lot of what I've learned about the way of living or how people interact with each other, I've learned symbolically through martial arts. Yeah, it's interesting because – um, martial arts, you know, to me, as, as Bruce Lee would say, you know, everything that I know, I pretty much learn from martial arts, I think. Um, mm -hmm. Martial arts is, is life changing. I'm sure, you know, a lot of people listening to this podcast right now, they're all also martial artists themselves. And, you know, it, it, I don't really even have to explain the benefits of it. I mean, everybody already knows the benefits. Um, I think martial arts, I really, really, really encourage martial arts training for anybody, you know, yeah. guy, girl, doesn't matter. Uh, if you're an Asian male, probably even more important uh, that, that you know some type of martial arts, you know, with all the stuff that we've been talking about, you know, how Asians are depicted in the media, how Asians are seen in Hollywood and, and therefore an extension seen in reality, seen in society. Um, not that, Hey, I'm telling you, Hey, martial arts is good. Do it. Therefore you can become, you know, a stereotypical Kung Fu man or something like that. But I'm talking about the benefits of martial arts. I'm talking about you training it, you knowing it. It's better that you know something than not knowing. And especially yeah. because martial arts, at least most martial arts were, you know, have their roots in Asia, you know, whether it's India, whether it's China, whether it's Japan, whether it's Korea, whatever, you know, uh, Thailand, whatever. It's so important that as an Asian person, you actually discover your roots or actually you keep in touch with your roots through martial arts. So I think that's also a very important way to look at it too, in, in terms of cultural understanding, in terms of uh, self-development, uh, in terms of understanding where you come from. And, uh, you know, it's it's very important for the mind as well to do, to do martial arts and uh, even even more so, it makes more sense that if you're Asian, you definitely should train martial arts. Even if you you know, even if you're not necessarily the greatest at it, you know, let's say you you're not a natural athlete or or you're not naturally coordinated or let's say you're starting really uh, you know late in the game, 
it ultimately doesn't matter because I know a lot of people that, you know, are late bloomers, they late starters. They didn't train martial arts until like they were in their 20s or late 20s or whatever it was. And it didn't matter because as they kept going and they going and going, as long as they kept at it, eventually people level level out and guys who were extremely good when they were 10 years old don't progress as fast later on in their career. And then guys who start later, they might seem like they're really s- slow to pick it up at first. It's like, oh, I'm getting my ass kicked by all these guys that are like 10-year-olds 10 year, 10 year or 20-year-olds. They actually improve faster later on because their body is still new to it. They're not damaged. They're not injured or whatever. So long as, as long as they kept up with it, everybody starts kind of leveling out at the same level. So for people who are wondering like, oh, should I start martial arts? I've never done it before. It's never too late to start something, right? It's all just about starting it and committing yourself to it. And uh, I think it's highly beneficial to, to anybody. Uh, and, and, and that's my honest, you know, advice to anybody listening who, who's wondering about doing martial arts. There's there's a different style for everyone too. I mean, someone could be more striking based, someone could be more jujitsu based, someone could be more traditional or something could be more actually sparring based. So, I mean, there's a different style that could fit whatever the personality. And and you just got to discover, you know, what style works for you. You got to discover what style benefits your body the most. So Mm -hmm. typically, if you're a long, lanky kind of guy, you would want to strike more. If you're like a short, stockier person, you probably want to wrestle more. You probably want to do more jujitsu. You want to do more grappling because it it benefits that body type a little bit more. Um, But really, it's just discovering what you like and what, what works for you. Some people don't like getting hit, so they don't want to strike. So they just want to grapple. They just want to wrestle. Some people hate wrestling, hate grappling. They they hate somebody, uh, you know, stuffed on top of them, squishing their face. They can't take that. They have some kind of, maybe some kind of, uh, you know, phobia where they can't get squished or something, or they feel like they're suffocating or something like that. So they would love to strike more. They would like to keep the distance more. Uh, it's really just about figuring out what you like. And of course, you know, MMA is is, you know, I in my opinion, you know, MMA is the the ultimate purest form of combat martial arts combat sports purest form of competition and if you are able to train striking and grappling and mix it all up and do mma you know i i think that is the 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 you know the hardest thing to do so if you're able to do that you know it you know props to you i think that pretty much wraps about wraps it up for 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 the first episode uh we'll talk about more as as we uh you know, progressed on to the later episodes. So, um, thanks for, uh, joining the call guys and, uh, appreciate it for, yeah, uh, you know, yeah, contributing. So thanks for and, having me. Uh, yeah, man. And, uh, I'll see you guys, uh, soon. I'll see you guys in the next yeah. episode. All, All right. right. Sounds cool. good. All right. Good night guys. Right. Yeah. Peace. Yeah.